Welcome. Thank you guys for being here. Hello. And uh, despite the logistical hurdles of having an extra million people come into your city this Austin uh, is big now. We don't care. It's fine. Well, there's a million five in Fredericksburg. That'd be a lot harder to, to deal with. Hi, I'm Eugene Sepulveda. I'm Josh Jones Stillworth. We're the co-founders of, of Culturati, and we're really thrilled that you're here. Wanted to... Um, well, why don't you introduce what culture? We have we have about thirty percent new people here, yeah, so, so why don't we, you introduce we, um, what culture so, is? We're so happy you're all are here. Um, always about a third of you are new. Some of you have been with us since the beginning. Thank you so much. Um, culture is designed to be um, intimate and honest, and so as you start going about the evening, I would just sort of center you on that. You are all leaders and innovators who believe in the power of culture, and you can all trust each other. And the whole point of culture is we're gonna to get together, we're gonna to open our playbooks, we're gonna share, we're gonna be candid in an environment where we don't have this kind of thing the rest of the year. So thanks for being here, we really appreciate you. Um, since 2022, we've been really ramping up a big focus on leading research and new emerging um, priorities and new emerging practices, and so I do want to give a shout out as we start to our partners at McKinsey and Microsoft. Um, without them, none of this would be possible, but they also challenge us, and they help steward our platform and you, our community, so thank you to all of them. Thank you. Yeah, and absolutely. Well, you know, after the interview, we'll come around and, and acknowledge a whole lot more people and all, all of our participants and, and sponsors. I want to talk about, you know, kind of framing where we find ourselves. And we're still looking for a new way to do business, you know, and, and we're still figuring out if people are going to come into the office or come in part time. And is it going to be hybrid? Is it going to be remote? And I was talking to a group of entrepreneurs the other day and where someone said, look, we get to redesign how we do business. We don't have to fall into an existing business model. I don't know that all the markers are in place to know exactly what that new redesign is, but Instead of what we must do, the opportunity that we have to recreate was very interesting to me. I think the opportunity for creativity is at an all-time high. It's right well, now, actually. And, and the same really thing when that. we're talking about the, ta the talent dynamic. You know, last time we were here, all the power was with the employees. Maybe now, according to you know, applications at many of your companies, it appears the, talent, the power dynamic is shifting perhaps to the companies. But it'll shift again. You know, what we know is, and particularly the people in this room, is that engagement, connection, purpose lead to higher performance. And so what are the opportunities outside of that shift in dynamic to, to create a model that will really result in greater performance and, and both sides flourishing? Well, it's you. Yeah, I think, I think the one thing we want to build on that with is um, there's also an opportunity to renegotiate when it comes to AI and, a, and an opportunity to be creative. And what we really believe is we're at like the very beginning of a decade or more journey where the capabilities are increasing at an exponential rate every year. And we're only at the very beginning stages of understanding what that does for culture, what that does to culture, what it does to leadership, what it does to collaboration, what it does to communication, we don't know yet, but we think it's gonna keep going and we think it's gonna keep being a big trend. And so the question for us this year, we think is really, what are you gonna do with the efficiency gains that you get? What are you gonna do with the creativity and the focus and the time that you get back? How, what's it gonna to mean to use that well? I think that's all I have to say on AI. <laughs> it's not? Yeah. Well, there's a lot more to say. It'll be said. <laughs> I'll be around all night. I see Walter's over on that end. We got to bring him over on this side. Okay. Um, we are so excited to, tonight um, and very grateful to have the opportunity to learn from um, Walter Isaacson. He's going to come up on stage in just a moment. Eugene's going to sit down and you're going to have our keynote interview. Then I'll come back up on stage and give you some instructions and yell at you about some details before we send you off. All right. Sound good? Hey, and what I'll add while Walter's coming up is... Um, you know, for those of you who, who haven't participate, participated before, we'll be going to dinners. We'll be breaking up into, I think we have, what, Misty, 13, 14 dinners. Um, some as small as eight, some as large as 12. And those 
places are one table conversations where you know you can you can kick off your learning and then your exploration and you'll get to know some more people so um, some of the questions that you're inspired with or the thoughts um, we hope that you'll bring those to the table with you Walter come on up thank you Eugene I appreciate it thank you very much boy it's great to be back in Austin what a town you have been spending some time here yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I will say one thing goes way back. I live in New Orleans, born and raised in New Orleans. If you're from New Orleans, you'll always remember what people did during the storm after Katrina. My kid brother had been at the University of Texas. My parents evacuated to Austin for six months. People said, come have dinner with us. You need anything? Our closets are open. Our refrigerator is open. So I doubt uh, Austin will get anything worse than an eclipse anytime soon. It won't get a hurricane. But if you ever need us, we're there for you. You're here. Thank you. So I, I doubt Walter needs an introduction, but in case there's someone that just woke up, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. Walter is a, a professor of history at Tulane. Uh, he had been the editor of Time Magazine, the CEO and chairman of CNN, the CEO of the Aspen Institute for, how long was that? About 15 years, yeah. it seemed, but it, it's very much like this campus. And there's a lot of connections I know with the Aspen Institute here in Walter. Um, he's now an advisory partner at Perella Winberg, a contributor at PBS, at CNBC, and the host of his own podcast, Trailblazer from Dell Technologies. You know, he's... Um, I explained to him earlier that I do not stalk him, though there was a time a few years ago where I saw him three weeks in a row in Washington, D.C. at NACD, at Santa Barbara for Arts and Letters, and then back at Capital Factory. And I still remember his eyes when I walked into Capital Factory and he was there. He's like, I may be under threat. <laughs> but, you know, his books include um, The Wise Men, Six Friends, and the World That They Make, Kissinger, Benjamin Franklin, Einstein, Steve Jobs, The Innovator, Leonardo da Vinci, The Code Breaker, and of course Elon Musk, which is why you've been spending so much time here most recently. Walter, our group is, is about culture and about leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go through many of the books, but I'd like to start out with your book on Elon, and I'd like to know what what is there for us to learn about Walt, about Alon's leadership yeah. in the context of culture and flourishing? When I was at Time Magazine, I knew almost all you needed to know about how to make a magazine. I had covered the fall of communism in Eastern Europe. I had laid out pages. When I went to CNN, I didn't understand the details. When I went to cover Elon Musk, I realized that he knew that both God and the devil were in the details. And he would walk the assembly lines, and he would figure out every minute part of manufacturing. And he would focus like a laser on whatever the problem might be. And when I asked him about it, he said it was like Napoleon's leadership style. He didn't just have to have a strategy. He had to be there on the battlefield. And if the troops saw him on the battlefield dealing with the details, the rest would follow. So the most amazing thing to me about Elon Musk was his um, feel for the engineering details and his understanding that it's the manufacturing and execution that's more important than the vision. Because vision without execution is just hallucination. And when I contrasted him to Steve Jobs, who had a much sort of more refined feel for design beauty, Steve Jobs would spend 90% of his time in the Johnny Ive design studio at Apple worrying about the curve of the chamfer of the iPhone and how it would feel. But then when it came time to making it, they just threw it over a wall somewhere and, and he never visited the factories in China. Musk knows that designing a car, designing a rocket is hard, but what matters is manufacturing it at scale. And how does his leadership extend to the troops? Well, first of all, he can be very rough on the troops. And as you'll see, there's a couple of times 
in the book, like down at Starbase, down near uh, Brownsville, where he he's furious because not enough people are working at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. And, you know, he gets the guy in charge of the pad called Andy Krebs and says, where is everybody? We'll never get to Mars if we're doing this 9 to 5 and phoning it in. And he was just really tough and rough on the guy. And then rough on another guy the next day, Lucas Hughes, who was in uh, sort of the financial guy, figuring out the cost of materials in the Raptor engine, and Elon knew <coughs> 10 times more about the cost of each material. So he jumps in. Um, I followed it for a year, these two people. And uh, first of all, the next day, they had flown down to Boca Chica, Starbase, more than 150 people from Cape Canaveral, Los Angeles, just to do what was called a surge, to get the rocket stacked. And it was that fierce sense of urgency that's one of Elon's five principles. And it worked. And Andy Krebs said, you know, after they had jumped down his throat or whatever, he said, I just wouldn't miss being on this journey. And same with uh, Lucas Hughes. He finally quits because he's just burned out. But after getting reamed out on this, Elon knows his name, calls on him and all the time. I saw Andy about three months ago in Los Angeles after he had left um, SpaceX and he came to a book event. And I see him walking up. I said, hey, Andy, what's up? He said, you know, I had a choice between being burned out or bored. And unfortunately, I took the path now of being bored. So I'm going to call and see if I can go back to SpaceX. So like Steve Jobs, he drives people crazy. He drives them to distraction. He drives them angry but he also drives them to do things they didn't know they'd be able to do. And most who survive, or all who survive and most, say, I wouldn't give up that chance for anything in the world. And they're inspired. They're both inspired, but it's also part, and any good CEO knows it, it's not just about how we're going to make money on this Starship rocket. It's about a grand sense of mission. And Elon was just down at Starbase a few, uh, I don't know, a week or so ago, once again talking about the mission of going to Mars. And as a very lonely kid growing up in South Africa, he had no friends, he was, you know, emotionally very awkward, beaten up a lot. He'd sit in the corner of the bookstore and he'd read. And he read uh, science fiction, so decided that space travel was incredibly important. He also believed in sustaining this planet. Uh, and he also believed that, because he read Asimov, that we had to worry about AI and whether the robots would turn on us. So ever since then, he's been guided not by profit motive or any, he just, as a mantra, chance, we have to become multi-planetary. We gotta get this rocket engine working so we can get to Mars. Secondly, we have to have EV vehicles. We have to have a mass market for electric vehicles. We've got to get the batteries right. And thirdly, as you know, he's formed his own AI company. So those three missions can... And if I look at all the people I've written about, it's generally about the sense of mission that propels things. You know, Einstein, as a young kid, is looking at a compass needle and how it twitches and points north. And he's mesmerized about how does a force field interact with something physical. And uh, he says he walked around with his hands sweating, trying to figure... Now, I know what was causing my hands to sweat growing up in New Orleans as a little kid, and it wasn't sort of force fields and magnets. But to his deathbed, he's writing those equations for a unified theory trying to get us closer, one step closer to the spirit manifest in the laws of the universe. Same with Benjamin Franklin. Throughout his life, he was trying to unite us as a country, which we need now. And he gave to the building fund of each and every church built in Philadelphia. At one point, funded a new hall that's still next to Independence Hall uh, for visiting preachers. He said, even if the Mufti of Constantinople would send somebody to preach Islam to us, we should offer a pulpit and listen if we might learn something. 
And on his deathbed, he's the largest individual contributor to the Mikva Israel Synagogue. And so when he dies, instead of his minister accompanying him, his casket to the grave, all 35 ministers, preachers, and priests march with him to the grave. And those were the type of missions these people were on. And I do think keeping your sense of mission and your sense of passion are the most important things you can do to rally your troops. So, I mean, Alon is not the only disruptive CEO who believes in hardcore culture versus nurturing culture. You mentioned Steve Jobs. It seems from, from reading both of those biographies, the lieutenants that they select are critical. Absolutely. And I'll give a shout out. I'm going to embarrass him. I was wondering but, if we'd bring him here. <laughs> Elon's chief of staff and the chief lieutenant building Gigafactory here in Austin and then doing Tesla is Omid Afshar in the white coat. And you get him to sign the book as well because he has authority to sign Elon's <laughs> name. I'm joking. He is typical of the lieutenants of Elon, which is willing to tell him the truth, but also understanding how to let Musk's mind get to the places it needs to. In the old days of Macintosh, when Steve Jobs created this separate Macintosh division at Apple, he was even more brutal at times of a boss than Musk or others. Uh, and they secretly, on the team, gave an award to the person who best stood up to Steve Jobs that year. Many of you in the room, I'll see, will be pleased to know that for the first three years, it was won by women. It was won by Andrea Cunningham and then by Joanna Hoffman and uh, uh, Kim, I can't remember. Steve finally found out about this. All three got promoted. So I do think that if you're going to be a tough boss, um, when uh, Steve was dying, really his last week or two, we were sitting in his backyard, or actually was by his downstairs bed. He was not strong enough to go up the stairs. I said, tell me what you're most proud of that you did. And I thought he'd say the iPhone or the Macintosh. Or... He said, no, making products is hard, but making a team that can continue to make products is the hardest thing. And so... It was the teams that people developed that made them great leaders. I remember reading in, in both books, both for Job and for Alon, that that the lieutenants would, uh, what they had in common is they would outweigh them, sometimes not actually act on their orders, I guess selectively, and had the ability to withstand the verbal onslaught. It was important, if you talk to Gwen Shotwell, who's the person who uh, is the president of uh, SpaceX, she will tell you, and I saw it many times, it's in the book, where Musk will make some really command-pushing decision, like, we're going to get rid of Falcon Heavy, because if we don't get rid of that rocket, we'll never move fast enough on Starship. And she, they kind of text her and say, Gwen, you got to get in here because, this is, you know. Um, and she says, okay, I get where you're coming from. You want us to move faster. Let me get all the facts. And over the course of the next two days, instead of arguing, it was a presentation of facts. Elon believes in first principles, which means take everything back to the most basic physics. Everything else is just a recommendation. And so if you give him the numbers and facts and figures, uh, he will, uh, like Steve Jobs and like many of the other people I've written about, absorb it. And he processes it. And then he will change course. Sometimes Elon in particular, and Steve as well, led by just what, what Steve's people call the reality distortion field, right. which is you just make an order that they don't think they can possibly do. And every now and then, Steve Jobs, when he was young, had gone to India and had a guru who taught him to stare without blinking, 
which was very unnerving, by the way. I've seen it. And even early on, when his friend Waz, Steve Wozniak from down the street, before they even started Apple, Steve and he were working at um, uh, Atari. And Steve said, we have to uh, f do this new game by Friday, because I want to get back to the Apple Orchard where they were working, hence the name of the company. And Waz said, you don't even know how to code as well as I do. There's no way it can be done by Friday. And Steve just stared at him without blinking and said, don't be afraid, you could do it. There are about five examples of that in the book over the years. Uh, but that was the reality distortion field, and Elon does that as well. He will say, we're going to have Starship stacked by Friday. Or he'll say, we're going to have Autonomy Day in February 2019. And he'll tweet it out sometimes, says, lay a marker. But that reality distortion, most of the time, pushes people to do things they didn't know they could do. We're going to have autonomous vehicles next year. Which he said that every that year for about the six or seven years. What's really interesting about Full Self Drive 12, the new version that's come out, and this is, to me, one of the most interesting things I got to see in the book at the very end. I, got, I was finished most of the reporting, and he sends me a text, says, come on back to Austin. There's something I want to tell you that uh, we can't do by phone. And it was about AI, but it was, he was saying, you know, he's going to start XAI, which he has. But he said the real AI is real-world AI, which is self-driving and Optimus, the robot, that can do it. And um, he said we're going to do it the same way that chatbots are doing it with language, which is it's going to learn from humans. There's a billion frames a week of video that Teslas around the world send back. And so... It was this new version of full self-drive is not done by rules, where somebody writes an algorithm saying, if you see a red light, stop. If you see a bike lane, don't. It's by learning from watching other humans. I think FSD 12 is almost there. The regulators aren't there, so it's going to take a while. But if it were up to me and I were driving to the airport, I'd have FSD 12 do it as opposed to me because uh, I think it's a better driver than I am. Now, that's not a high bar, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> Particularly tomorrow at 4.30 in the morning, yeah. Mike. Yeah. Um, so especially in, in the Kissinger biography, at the end of the Kissinger biography, Walter, you, you summed up both the good and the bad. And you were fairly philosophical about how Henry was already being assessed, but how he would be, how his tenure would be assessed in the future. Um, I realize, you know, maybe that's going to be in the next in the next edition of of the Elon Musk book. But if you were writing more of that summary today, what would you be saying? On Elon Musk, yeah. or Dr. Kissinger. Um, about fifty years ago, we went to the moon. And then we gave up. About 20 years ago, we had space shuttles. They could take our astronauts into orbit. And then we gave up. And then they finally decided to give Boeing a contract and SpaceX a contract to get US astronauts into the orbit. Because NASA, US couldn't do it. Musk has now done multiple missions to the space station and back with astronauts. There's a Polaris mission coming up. Boeing is yet to launch a test flight, and NASA still can't do it. He single-handedly brought us back into the era of space travel. Likewise, he, more than anybody, he's brought us into the era of electric vehicles, and the, as important, manufacturing electric vehicles and batteries, because uh, we gave up on manufacturing here in the United States. Now you got the biggest factory in some ways in the world, in this town because of that. Um, in terms of Neuralink, implanting the chip in the brain, it just happened. And he was able to have brain waves of somebody communicate with a computer. That will be the biggest deal in the digital revolution. Uh, the buying of Twitter and X, at some point he's going to make it into the everything app, like 
um, Alibaba, WeChat, some of the Chinese stuff, which is what he wanted to do with X.com, which he started years ago, and it morphed into PayPal. Um, I think that will be interesting, but to be honest with you, I think his unfiltered impulses and dark streak, because he has a demon dark mode at times, it's bad for him being on X. And he, in a country that's become too polarized and too divided, he leaps into the fray as if it was some, you know, somebody in the X-Men comics he read as a kid, and I think it harms his ability to get things done now and will be a, uh, well, it's why I, I suspect 30 or 40 percent of the people in America, you know, dislike him. I think that will be not a major part of his legacy, but it'll be a bad part of his legacy. Not, not the taking over of what is now X and turning it into an everything app, but leaping too much into our polarized discourse right. instead of trying to unite us. Not just leaping into, but I mean, it, amplifying it greatly, unfortunately. Yeah, and all point. social media has the drawback, I teach this at Tulane in my class, of having algorithms that are there to increase engagement, whether right. you're Facebook, Instagram, X, uh, if the algorithm keeps you on longer, you make more money. Well, unfortunately, the way to increase engagement is to increase enragement. Right. Meaning, if you say, this is the most outrageous thing you'll ever see, can you believe the Democrats or the Republicans did this, boom, it's going to be amplified. I was there at CNN when I was trying to hold things together as a network that just reported. Uh, but Fox was coming up on one side, MS on the other. And my boss is up in New York. He said, wait a minute, you're spending a million dollars a month keeping Christian Amanpour and Nick Robertson in Baghdad and keeping these bureaus open. For one-tenth of that, you could have a Bill O'Reilly or a Tucker Carlson and get ten times the ratings. That's when I left, when my contract ended, and went to the Aspen Institute, which is designed to pull us together. So we got a lot of problems in this country with media that by its technology and by the mindset of the people in media now seek to divide us rather than to unite us. And I think Elon has not been on the good side of that divide. Thank you. Um, I want to move over to really talk a little bit about innovators. Um, I found that book in particular I went back and just reread it the other day. The, one of the most inspiring books around culture and creativity and innovation. And Thank you. That My publisher, I want you to tell them that because <laughs> if you write a biography, it's, I mean, right. Steve Jobs, Elon Musk. When you ask me about leadership, after doing Steve Jobs, I realize that leadership is not about just the great one person. It's about teams that innovation is a team sport, and uh, you know leadership is a collaborative endeavor. And whether it was Intel or even Apple, the ability of people to collaborate and work together is what advances us. So, so I decided to write a book called The Innovators that didn't have a central character, but it was about teamwork. This is exactly what I want to talk about. I mean, what is it especially about the digital age that has heightened the importance of team? One thing is that it's embedded into the genetic code of the architecture of the digital age that it distributes authority. By that I mean the internet, the web, social media makes it so that hierarchical structures can easily be circumvented, as any of you know. But uh, just take the, let's take uh, the web design, uh, uh, packet switch networks. Uh, at the time they were doing that in the 60s or 70s, uh, a packet switch network, unlike a circuit, meaning what the bell system would have, would, a circuit would have central switching stations and hubs you had to go through, just like an airline will have to have hubs and spokes. But a packet switch network, every single packet and every single node 
the packets can go any way at once. It scurries around the web, and all of the millions of nodes have equal power to send and receive. That made it so that it couldn't be knocked out by a Russian nuclear attack. You couldn't just take out a central... And uh, the people who invented, when I asked them, they said, no, no, that's not why we did it. We were all graduate students. We were avoiding the draft. We weren't trying to help the Pentagon fight a nuclear war. But if you go back, that's why they were being funded. But in that architecture, I could give many answers to your question, but I'll just give one. In that architecture of packet switching, web, hypertext transfer protocols, it means nobody gets to play gatekeeper. There's no general that has colonels, that have, you know, lieutenants, sergeants, uh, corporals all the way down the line. And it empowers, uh, by distributing authority, each of the nodes. Which means if you're going to be a leader in this digital age, you can't do it top-down command structure. I'll pick somebody from Austin who I just talked to about this, Bill McRaven, and sure. used to be the, whatever he was, chancellor of UT. And uh, he was- in charge of SEALs. Right, <laughs> and um, he was in New Orleans a week or so ago, and we were talking about some. And I said, what was harder, running the University of Texas or catching bin Laden? <laughs> and he said, well, you know the answer. And he said, the problem is people think that if you've been in the military, you can just give commands, and then it goes down the chain of command and people salute. But at the University of Texas or a university, you can't do that. He said, first of all, you definitely can at the University of Texas. And anybody who nowadays says you can do that in the military hasn't served in the military. Everywhere, authority has been decentralized. By the way, where's Admiral Howard? Who, you know, so Admiral, Admiral Howard, yeah, I don't that, know sir? if y'all have met, but yeah. um, who also in, in, in the vertical with, with SEALs. But, but talk a little bit more about the importance of, of teams creatively. And, and you talk about how it's not just, it's not just among peers. And we saw, particularly in, in innovators, that those scientists that didn't have the, the um, that weren't in teams were less successful, even though they yeah. might have been better scientists. Yeah. But it wasn't just between peers. You pointed out between generations, and you pointed out between humans and machines. Yeah, the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration enabled by packet switch digital decentralized networks uh, makes it important to figure out how you're going to build the right team. You can take in Silicon Valley, if I were to say the best team ever built, it was probably the founding team at Intel, where you have Bob Noyce, who is just mm -hmm. the nicest, great visionary. You have Gordon Moore, who's a great engineer, and if you can figure out Moore's Law, but you needed on the team somebody to get the microchips out the door, somebody who had escaped Nazis and escaped the communists, and Andy Grove needed to be the tough guy. So when you're forming a team, you got to say, how do I get each player on the infield and outfield in the right position? Likewise, the other great team you might want to look at is the founding of our country, in which you had to have passionate people like Samuel Adams and his cousin John. You had to have smart people like Jefferson and Hamilton, uh, Madison. You had to have a person of great rectitude like Washington. But you also needed the glue who could bring a team together, and that was Benjamin Franklin's role. So when you're building a team, you got to say, who's playing what role, and who's the guy or the woman who's the glue bringing them together? Excellent. History hasn't been particularly fair acknowledging women's contributions right. in science or in technology. Um, why is that? And, and who are some that should have greater recognition? I wrote a biography of Jennifer Doudna called The Code Breaker. Right. It was the one before Elon Musk. I do remember going into both my editor and publisher at Simon & Schuster, both of whom were women, and saying, I want to do this person, Jennifer Dowden, whose name you can't pronounce, who invented a technology called CRISPR that you don't know what it stands for and that nobody's ever heard of. 
uh, I think I had earned the right by then to do it because, you know, Steve Jobs, the book is done. And they said, well, okay. But the reason I did it is because Jennifer, when I was looking, what's the greatest new technology we're going to have for the 21st century? Right. One answer would be gene editing, the ability to target any sequence of DNA and to rewrite it. So we've already now, about four months ago, cured sickle cell in a patient by using CRISPR. If you can make the sickle cells carry more oxygen and you're about to have a kid, you can say, well, I want to use it so my kid blood cells carry twice as much oxygen as normal. And so you'll have a Olympic sprinter or something. We'll be able to edit our children. This is huge. And when I talked to Jennifer Dowden, who eventually, before I finished the book, wins the Nobel Prize, uh, is able to use RNA technology to help do a corona, uh, COVID uh, vaccine as well as edit genes. My publisher says, okay, okay, you're right. But um, when I talked to her, I said, how did you end up in science? She said, well, when I was in high school, I told my guidance counselor I wanted to be a scientist. And he said, no, girls don't do science. And this would have been what year? So she's... This would have been, I would say, the 1970, late 70s. Wow, so. She would have been in middle school in Ilo, Hawaii. And she gets home after... She's a little upset by this, so she decides she's going to be a French teacher. But her dad leaves a book on her bed called The Double Helix, which is James Watson's account of the discovery of the structure of DNA. And she thinks it's a mystery because it's a little paper. And she reads it one and realizes it is a mystery. It's a mystery about the hunt for the secret of life on this planet. And she's struck by the fact that there's a character in the book named Rosalind Franklin who, with Watson and Crick, Rosalind Franklin is the one who does the I'll say, photographic imagery of the uh, DNA. Right. And uh, had she not died, she would have shared the Nobel Prize with him. Uh, Watson treats Rosalind Franklin a bit dismissively because he's a sexist old guy. But still, he treats her science very respectfully. And Jennifer said to me, when I read that book, I didn't care how dismissive, well, I didn't even notice that Watson was dismissive it dawned on me that women could be scientists. And so I think there's a wind, right. uh, you know, nowadays I hope it's ending. There are actually of people doing graduate work in the life sciences at the moment, 65% of women, 35% of men. So I think that's changing. And some of the women that should be, get greater recognition in the technology field were would include who? Yeah. There is a bro, tech bro, hackathon mentality and culture that I still think is a bit of a wind in the face uh, for women engineers in the right. uh, tech world. We saw um, that at Google a yeah, few years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm very dedicated to writing about women in innovation, because I do think, uh, and as you know, The Innovators, the right. book you politely touted, it is frame, the framing device, the opening chapter, the last chapter, is Ada Lovelace, right. who is the birth of the computer algorithm, the general purpose computer, the concept of it in the 1840s. Um, I, if you want, I can talk about what I'm doing now, which is the same. Yeah, yeah. please. Uh, I'm doing a book on uh, Marie Curie uh, because Marie Curie is kind of well-known, sort of, as like, okay, woman in science, Marie Curie. And there are a lot of grade school books about her, middle school books. But I've been reading her scientific notebooks, and they're absolutely fascinating. She is the person who with her husband, Pierre, at the beginning of the century, discovers basically that chemistry is physics, that it's all just about the, how the electrons go around the mm -hmm. nucleus. And then she discovers radiation, how they radiate. And after her husband dies, she's able to use that to fill in the periodic table, to figure out polonium and radium. 
She wins a Nobel Prize for physics in 1903, I think. And then, uh, after her husband dies, she goes into mourning, but has then an affair with his favorite student, Paul Langevin, a physicist who's a friend of Einstein, been a student of her late husband, who unfortunately is married. Um, he, she is with Paul Langevin and Einstein up in Brussels for a conference. When she gets the telegram that she's won the second Nobel Prize, still the only person to have won, only person, man or woman, to have won Nobels in two separate sciences. The next day, the Paris newspapers break the story of her affair because Langevin's wife had found the love letters. She gets a telegram from the Swedish Academy saying, given what's happened, it's best if you don't come to Stockholm and accept your award because it's too much controversy. She writes back and says, if I were a man, you would not have sent me that. And she goes to Stockholm and accepts it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't think people know her story, and they don't know her science right. that well. And plus, it means I get, my wife and I get to spend part, most of the next year in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning French. Um, also, <laughs> more about, about innovation. One of, one, of the, one of the quotes that I... I extract it with a trait common among so many innovators is that they are all that they are slow to learn the difference between initiative and disobedience. Everybody has to be challenging authority. Whether you look at Einstein who couldn't get his doctorate for years because he kept challenging authority, challenging the most basic authority, which is the first paragraph of Newton's Principia that says time marches along second by second, irrespective of how we observe it, and he's, like, challenging that. Um, ben Franklin, of course, runs away. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, they all have, they're all somewhat misfits as child children, and they become rebels. You know, Leonardo's in a small village of Vinci, left-handed, distracted, gay, uh, born out of wedlock, his father won't legitimate him. He runs away to Florence. And all Florence. this known by the time he's 14. Right, right, <laughs> right. So. But all of them have a natural resistance to received wisdom and authority. Uh, Elon Musk, of course, fits into that category. Uh, he has a five-step algorithm. If you're a CEO, you'll want to read in the book. I Break it out. You can skip the rest of the book. Just go right to the algorithm. But step one is question every requirement. And I'd watch him do it. Somebody would say, why, why do we have to have a plug in these? Or why do we have to have a mat underneath this? And, the t and they'd say, well, it's a requirement. He said, well, who made the requirement? And they might say, well, the legal department or the safety department or the U.S. military. He said, I don't want to know the name of the department. I want to know the name of the person who made the book. And he would do that. He would stand there sometimes on the assembly line saying, F and then they sometimes bring a trembling person <laughs> to him. And he'd say, this makes no sense. Why? Now, and he said, if you're not questioning enough requirements and deleting enough parts that you have to end up reversing yourself on at least 20%, then you're not being defiant enough. I love reading time and time and time again where where Lon knew that he was going that he intended to go further than he should and yep. in, and planned to build back and that was yeah, I mean, no, beyond zero sum yeah he actually felt that if you didn't have to walk back right 20 percent you hadn't charged ahead far enough uh I'm, we're gonna uh allow the audience to ask questions for in and but let me get one more question in about who you consider the greatest entrepreneur, the first great entrepreneur in America, Benjamin Franklin. Oh, yeah, I was about to answer your question, which is Ben Franklin, no yeah. question, yeah. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing about Benjamin Franklin, like everybody I've written about, is that they stood at the intersection of entrepreneurship, technology, and humanity, humanities. And so Franklin was the greatest writer of a, a time, but he was also the greatest experimental Scientists. We think of him as a doddering dude flying a kite in the rain, uh, saying a penny saved is a penny earned. But those electricity. He's very Warren Buffett that way. He yeah. manages yeah. He public manages image. He manages his image. 
better than anybody you and right. certainly better than Elon Musk does. Uh, but those electricity experiments are right. the most important, and the uh, lightning rod is the most important technology of that period. Um, and so what he does is he ties together the technology, the entrepreneurship, and the humanities, even on things like he's a printer, and he realizes people who print Bibles, that makes no sense. People buy a Bible once in their life or something. Mm -hmm. So he creates Paul Richard's Almanac. They got to buy it every year. But then he franchises all of his apprentices and his cousins up and down the coast, from Boston to Providence, down to uh, Bermuda, but all the way down South Carolina through, so that they have print shops and he's franchising the content. And then, like John Malone and Ted Turner and others, he realizes, I need the distribution system. I need to control it. Back then, if you wanted to send something from Philadelphia to Charleston, it went by ship to London, to the post office, and then came back. He creates the Colonial Postal Service and, of course, favors his own content for a while. So he is just like the great information technology entrepreneurs. But, and... and as leaders interested in culture mm -hmm. and and culture and, and success of companies, what, what is there to learn from, from Benjamin Franklin? It's about the team. Benjamin Franklin was not the smartest of the founders. You know, obviously Madison and Jefferson and probably Hamilton, although I think he's gotten a bit overrated since <laughs> he went on Broadway. Um, <laughs> but... Franklin understood a couple of things. One, it was about creating a team. And secondly, and this is the most difficult thing you're going to do as a CEO, I've watched Elon do it, I've watched Steve do it, uh, is when do you stand fast on what you call your right. principles and when do you compromise? And whether it's in politics or diplomacy or in business, you have to know sometimes when do I push and be stubborn about something I've decided. Well, particularly as you talked about his time in France. You yeah. know, um, but in what, what I remember also is his intentional, his intentionality about idealism and how he knew that it would be an important beacon not only to... Mm -hmm to the citizens of these 13 separate um, states, but, but of uh, colonies, but, but to the rest of the world. One of the things he was able to balance that we have screwed up royally today is that American foreign policy has two strands, idealism and realism. Henry Kissinger is one of the say, true realists. Right. You know, he said you shouldn't allow sentiment and morality to you know, uh, when he undercut the Kurds, for example, he said foreign policy should not be confused with missionary work. What I think Kissinger misunderstood is, yeah, we have to be tough, cold realists, but also our power comes from our moral standing in the world and our ideals. On the other hand, if you're just floating around with idealism and stuff, and you don't do a crass right. balance of power diplomacy, you're going to find yourself in a pickle. What Franklin does is when he gets to France, he realizes the ideals are what's going to capture the world. And so he builds a printing press, and he prints the Declaration. He prints the, you know, Constitution for the State of Virginia and Massachusetts. All these things that he knows with the French welling up with their liberty, equality, fraternity, will love... But then he also plays a very calculated balance of power game with the Bourbon Pact nations, you know, France, the Netherlands, and Spain, against the English to say, here's what's going to happen on trade in the Mississippi and everything else, and it's in your interest to be in on our side. So I think you have to figure out how do you stand true to principles and how do you compromise? How do you stand true to idealism and how do you become a realist? And in our current age, on cable TV and on X and other places, you're supposed to have a soundbite answer that you're all on one side or all on the other. Right. 
And what Franklin realized is life is about balance, because he understood Newton, and he understood the positive and negative flow of electricity. Um, audience, we have some questions for Walter. And Misty, is there a mic? Is that Shaquille? Um, Go for it. Here, why somebody... Or speak real loudly, we'll repeat. I actually want to continue your conversation that you were just having about realism and uh, morality, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in the current world situation, uh, how are the things that Kissinger stood for, or the book you wrote on Kissinger, which we just recently read also, right? A number of things that are happening are shaped on that. So how would Kissinger have handled that in the current situation? Well, I think, you know, having talked to him near the end of his life on Ukraine, which is a good, for example, thing, um, obviously, Russia invading uh, Ukraine uh, is not only an immoral thing, but it upsets the order that we have of you don't do nation states. However, Kissinger would feel that there are certain realities on the ground, that Kiev is never going to recapture Crimea in this war, and that Russia is never going to capture Kiev, and that what's happened now is we're uh, losing a thousand casualties a month for a few kilometers back and forth on the front line. So he would have felt that there's a basic realist deal to be made, which is not try to settle everything. Don't settle it. Just have a ceasefire in place, a truce, and have occupied territories. Let, you know, uh, Crimea is occupied by Russia now. You don't have to solve everything now. Uh, but just accept the realities of the facts on the ground. Um, secondly, when you get to the realism and idealism, it is an extraordinary mess when it comes to Gaza and Israel and the terrorist attack on Israel and everything else. I do think that in this world, both our strength and it should be for Israel's strength, Part of it comes from the sense that there's a certain moral purpose. And I would have, and I think Kissinger would have said, yes, you know, there's, there's not an easy solution to the military situation, but all sides should be focused on getting humanitarian aid in so that we would have a higher sense that we're better than other countries. I don't want to wade into too much controversy, and I will assure you I have no answer to the question of what's happening in the Middle East now. But Hi, Walter. I'm Cassandra Worthy. I founded a leadership development company called Change Enthusiasm Global. You have to have an incredible strength of curiosity to do the work yeah. that you do and continue to do. And when we follow that path of curiosity, we learn. So I'm curious, what have you learned about yourself in all of these conversations? Or perhaps how have you seen yourself change because yeah. of this curiosity. Yeah, I've become more self-aware, but let me start with curiosity, which is the theme of every one of my books, whether it's Leonardo's notebooks where he's looking, as you would at Lake Austin, as I just did, you know, this afternoon, and how the ripples are moving differently from the wind. He's trying to figure out why. Or he writes, why is the sky blue? And Einstein had put that in his notebook. He's curious about things we see at all times, but we stop being curious about. We don't, you know, at a certain point in our life, a grown-up says, stop asking so many stupid questions, and the curiosity begins to drain from us. Both from Elon Musk, who's interested in everything, to Steve Jobs, who cared about samurai warriors and how they worked, to Ben Franklin, the common thread and Leonardo's the ultimate example, is a person who's curious about to know everything you could possibly know about every subject that was possibly knowable, at which point you start seeing patterns across nature. So among the things I've done is I realize I will never have the mental processing power of Albert Einstein. But 
believe it or not, I can be just as curious. Because as Einstein said, he said of himself, I'm no smarter than the average physicist. I'm just more curious. That's not true. He was smarter than them. But I took a walk from my building. I walked down to the lake. And I did what I do on every walk was I intentionally sort of push myself to observe three, four, five things that were kind of curious. And that included the ripples. It also included why light glints in a certain way off of a leaf, which is something I saw Leonardo draw. So I was watching it. I stopped at the little signs talking about the recycling of water on this campus and which plant is growing and why. And I thought of alfalfa plants with deeper. I then Googled it, you know, so that nowadays you can learn anything. So I push myself to be more curious. On the downside, I've learned that I love the pursuit of knowledge and curiosity, but I'm not a great manager. I'm just, uh, Elon Musk said to me, you think empathy is good. You think it's your friend. Empathy can sometimes be your enemy because it makes you selfish. He said, when I, he said to me, when you were running CNN, when I was running it, you cared too much about everybody's feelings. And it was selfish because it wasn't just you cared about them. You wanted them to like you. And so you didn't disrupt CNN enough because you were too eager to please people and have them like you. And I did realize that that is a weakness I have had as a leader. Is that internalized enough? <laughs> Any other questions? There's a woman there right behind the plant for you, yes. Good evening, Alandra Washington with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and good to see you again, Walter. Oh, hey, the Kellogg, yes, welcome. Yes. Good to see you. Uh, question, I wanted to go back to the issue around culture, and you talked about Elon Musk and sort of his voice around either amplifying the vision or pulling together. If you were to advise him, number one, would you advise him on how to use voice to pull people together and pull the country together? And if so, what would you say? Yeah, as a rule, I was a biographer and tried not to be an advisor. There were a couple times he said, well, Walter said that. But I always tried to do it Socratically. I would sort of ask a question. And I did often, after he bought Twitter, you know, ask questions like, will that end up creating more division? Will that be good for, will that, um, you know, I, how on the record are we? I mean, is this broadcast uh, all of? The reporter is not here yet. I know, but I mean, is it, will this be on the internet or YouTube or? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna do it anyway. If I, were, if I were sitting with Musk right now, I would say, You've got a pretty huge legacy ahead of you. In some ways, a great, you know, innovator and leader, bringing us into space, electric vehicles, AI, whatever. Why undermine that by late at night bursting in an unfiltered way some of your angry thoughts that there amplify people who have even angrier thoughts. This is not good for the country. It's not good for X. It's not good for Tesla sales, probably, but I don't know. But it's just not great. It's not good for us. And at the very end of my book, I address this question, because I had talked to him about it, but more Socratically. And there's, I'll say, uh, the name is in the book, Antonio Gracias, one of his closest friends. And we were talking after the Starship first test flight. Antonio said if he would only not send out tweets late at night this way. And Antonio told the story of taking away Elon's phone one night when they were traveling and putting it in Elon's hotel room safe. But... Antonio punched in the code. So Elon couldn't get up at night because he knew Elon was in a foul mood. At 3 that morning, Elon called hotel security, made him open the safe. And I said, well, couldn't, shouldn't there be, I asked Musk, 
wouldn't it be great if Twitter had an impulse control key where you, you'd tweet something bad, but it would hold it, like I can do with my iPhone email. It always says send in half an hour, so I can. Uh, but read the last paragraph. The question is whether Elon Musk with an impulse control button would still be the person sending rockets to Mars. Shakespeare teaches us, and we biographers follow it, that we have to tell the good and the bad, the dark and the light about everybody, and every strand. And it's not like you can just pull out the dark strand and keep the fabric intact. Sometimes they're all interwoven. And Shakespeare, the way he says it at the end of Measure for Measure, is that even the best are molded out of faults. So Elon has this dark fault of not having an impulse control key. It would be great if we could add one to his public pronouncements, but it's also one has to think that would a Musk with an impulse control button still be the one nodding at that last moment on a test flight for Starship, knowing that it probably is not going to be a perfect flight, but saying Boeing would never do this, NASA would never do it, but let's launch. What, what is the quote you put at the beginning of the book? The one from him? Yeah, he said it was. Um, he said, "Hey, I'm sending uh, rockets to Mars and reinventing the concept of electric vehicles. Did you also expect me to be a chill dude?" <laughs> yeah. Next question. Next. Oh, okay, come on. So um, I was curious about come another on. B word. We talked about burnout and boredom, and that these incredible achievers were often somewhat imbalanced. How about another B word, balance? Do you think it's possible from some of these amazing leaders you've uh, interviewed and talked about to achieve great things and not be kind of way over on that intense edge? Is that the only way people achieve great things? Uh, yeah, and uh, Wired did a cover story after my Steve Jobs book about the book, and the cover line was, do you have to be an asshole? So, I mean, it's, do you have to be intense? Do you have to be an asshole? Yeah, and in, in, in certain ways, if you look at some great innovators, uh, Bill Gates in the early days of Microsoft, Bezos in the early days of Amazon, Steve in the Macintosh team, Elon, you got to have passion and you got to push. Um, at a certain point, balance needs to kick in. And... That was why Steve gets ousted at Apple. Um, it's why you need Tim Cook as well as, or you need um, Andy Jasser at Amazon, people who bring balance. Uh, I also think that there are other great leaders who lead through understanding balance. You will have at these conferences lots of authors, and I hope none are in this room now, who write books saying the seven secrets to leadership or the 12 you know, keys to success. Biographers don't do that. We tell you instead about real people, and we let you, in, you know, by induction, figure things out. Benjamin Franklin was all about balance. And to my mind, he was the indispensable leader in the founding of our country in terms of pulling together the Declaration, Washington won their Constitution. Likewise, Jennifer Doudna is a team builder with balance. I can tell you great leaders who have led that way. I can also tell you about Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, who, whose passion outweighs their sense of balance. And I can, as I answered your question, I can perhaps prompt you to look inside yourself. And if there's one piece of advice, there's only one piece of advice ever given in great human history, and that's 3,000 years ago above the Oracle of Delphi's temple, know thyself, which is know yourself. Don't try to be who you're not. At a certain point, I knew I couldn't break open CNN and fire people, whatever. You've got to know your moral balance. And compounded with that is what I said earlier. And it's got to be about something larger than yourself. 
even for Elon or for Steve Jobs, it wasn't about, even though they made the richest company and became the richest person, it was about doing something larger. And uh, that gives a slight humility that leads to balance, but sometimes it takes a decade or two to kick in when you're a founder. So I'm assuming we have 12 seconds, but let's add 60 seconds to the clock. Um, I wanted to add, end with three rapid fire questions. AI, friend or foe? AI will be a definite destroyer of democracy as it now stands in terms of being able to generate fake news and hateful things and misinformation at a scale two or three orders of magnitude more than we do it now. But Musk's contention is the same as Isaac Asimov's, is that the more tightly you connect humans to machines, this is the Ada Lovelace school, that the symbiosis of humans and machines will keep the machines uh, subject to human agency. And that's the hope in the long run. I worry about this year's election, though. Uh, second, you already answered it. It was going to be how important is curiosity to success. Is it? It's number one. <laughs> um, and we and can all do it. Third, Matthew Riebling, who's not able to be with us, but he wanted to know, who do you want to write your biography? You know, those of us who write about people who go into the arena, like you all, those of you who are CEOs and founders, and we write about people who have taken risks and thrown themselves and created great co companies, we should not fall prey to the conceit that we are also in the arena. Uh, and so I don't think that there's a biography of me to be done. The biography of me is basically the biography of Walter, I've you're probably the most important contemporary Renaissance man today. That has... The, uh, I mean, in a so beautiful many thing fields. to say, but it, it has in the so odious smell of untruth to it. <laughs> well, we'll in we'll there, and y'all can talk about that at dinner. Walter, thank you thank so you. much. <laughs>
uh, there's a fancy internet app that you should for real download. Have you ever been at a conference and downloaded the app and been frustrated and want to let your phone on fire? This app is the app I've been looking for for a very long time. <laughs> it is fabulous. It has the schedule. It will All the reviews and uh, ratings that you'll do afterwards will be on the app. Uh, download the app, download the app, download the you app. You know, it's a fabulous. feature that we added to it, so during the sessions, you'll be able to make notes of any takeaways, and if you have action items, we'll roll those up and send them to you in a PDS after the, the summit. And if you ask for those to be timelined, we'll, you know, the squeaky wheel will ping you yeah. periodically. And this is just my need. One, because I take all these great notes, but then I forget to act on them all the time. And certainly when I start acting on them, then in a quarter, I forget that I was going to follow up on something. So we're going to try this and see that that can't be helpful. Yeah, please do that, really. Okay, great. Uh, I have other logistics. Do you have anything else? I do. I want to, we're, we're Jonathan and Kirsten, so I want to acknowledge. So we're starting out a, a, a $500,000 capital campaign to expand Culturati in the programs that we're working on. And Jonathan and Kirsten agreed to be the first contributors at $50,000 to that. So th thank you very much. Thank you so much. What logistics? Okay, you're going to dinner now. You're going to have one table conversations. You're going to follow Lady Bird Johnson rule. Most of you know what you're doing there. If not, someone will explain it to you. The bougie vans are out front. Uh, they will start loading you at 6.30. It's really going to leave at 6.45, so don't get left behind. Get your book signed by Walter for the next 20 minutes. Goodbye. We love you. Okay. Thanks, all. Tomorrow.